questions. Question, Dr. West, when I announced a reparations panel with Dr. Darity and yourself, one of my one of my members said, Man, what? Dr. West support reparations? And he said, every time I talk about supporting Dr. West, I had somebody come to me and say, but Dr. West don't support reparations. So I, I got a two two part question for you. What do you how do you respond to that? And why is it that you not only support reparations, but you've included it in your presidential uh, campaign? Well, one, brother, is that uh, I've tried to be as true to the quest for truth and justice as I can be. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Can't tell the truth about America without listening to the suffering of precious human beings. And that's, of course, indigenous peoples initially, and then my ancestors, dignified Africans who were enslaved. Now, I was blessed to sit at the feet of Queen Mother Moore. Now, my brother talks about Queen Mother Moore, who she was called the mayor of Harlem. I lived in Harlem for 20 years. And so she was my mayor. And she was one of the great figures that had to break through a tied Republic of New Africa and so on. The same was true with Randall Robinson. Randall Robinson and I shut Harvard down in 1972. I was president of the Black Student Association. He was president of the Pan-African Legal legal society. He was at Harvard Law. He comes, he comes straight out of Richmond, Virginia. He just passed. We'll never forget him. He wrote a book called The Debt. And Brother Sandy knows that classic. And when he founded Trans Africa, I was on the committee with, I was there at the meetings with Danny, Danny Glover and Charles Ogletree and others. Charles, of course, my dear, dear brother, who was also my lawyer. He, he was fighting for reparations in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I was born. And so I've been part of the reparations movement ever since I was 20 some years old. So I don't know why people say, why well, brother West reparation? That's like saying I don't love Curtis Mayfield. Come on now. Hey, <laughs> it's constitutive of who I, who I am. We spent time in the movement between Mother Moore to Randall Robinson to Charles Ogletree on to, and we should not, it's, it's Darity and Mullins. This is the co authored text with our magnificent sister. True. But this is, as you say, I mean, this is the scholarly foundation of any serious discussion about truth and justice as it relates to Afro-American, to Black people's past and present. It's very important. It's not just talking about slavery. We're talking about neo-slavery, Jim and Jane Crow. We're talking about present-day di discrimination. So we got three pillars, and that's one of the great breakthroughs, because Queen Mother Moore and the others primarily talked about slavery, as I recall. I mean, my brother Sandy, you 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 know correct me, but I just remember as a young person they were primarily talking about slavery. But the but this is the, uh, the the most crucial scholarly basis of any discussion. And I always talk about reparations in terms of truth and justice. If you're concerned about the truth of America's past and present, and if you see damage, what kind of repair are we talking about? Like tort law. What kind of repair are we talking about? If you're not interested in truth and justice, then you're not going to be interested in reparation. If you're interested in truth and justice, you're going to be persuaded by the powerful case made, and there's going to be some serious movement as to how we go about doing that. And that's why reparation has always been a fundamental part of, of, of who I am. And if one, and running for president, of course, it's, it's number one at the top of the racial justice list, tied to a whole host of other things as well, ending mass incarceration. We want schools of quality. We want free health care for folk. We want free education and so on. So that uh, I don't know why people would say that. It could be because of my relation to Brother Bernie Sanders. Because I, I was with Bernie twice. And Bernie and I had a lot of disagreements. We had disagreements about the uh, uh, Palestinian struggle. We had disagreements about PDS, the boycott, divest sanctions. But he's still my brother. We just got disagreements. That's all. I like what he says about Wall Street greed. I like what he says about trying to eliminate inequality and so forth. And you see this again in this magnificent text in terms of the, the racial wealth gap and the, the deep concern about how we get egalitarian status of black folk vis-a-vis -vis others. So in that sense, I just don't know why, you know, people would, would say that, but everybody can't know everything. <laughs> I understand, that. I understand that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, it got so bad, Dr. Weston, I put out a very short clip. Just, the, just me asking you that question. Just so people would know, and I guess I, I need some reach like Cat Williams to reach everybody. <laughs> let them know. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> but uh, I, I appreciate you. Um, well, you know, there's uh, 
there's lots of falsehoods that circulate around many of us. And I think it's a consequence of the fact that we're frequently trying to take stands on issues that are very disturbing to a lot of people. Yeah. And so they 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 craft lies about us and use them as weapons uh, to attack us. But but I was thinking, you know, we should make special mention of two of the four mothers of the reparations effort in the United States. Uh, one of whom, uh, one of whom, Brother Cornell has already talked about, uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore. And interestingly enough, my co-author, Kirsten Mullen, did a, a, an article on Queen Mother Audley Moore uh, for Vanity Fair uh, towards the latter part of 2023. Um, I think it's really, uh, it's really quite a nice piece. But Queen Mother Audley Moore's predecessor uh, via Marcus Garvey was Callie House. And Mary Frances Berry has a marvelous book called My... My Face is, is Black is True, which is a biography of Callie House, who really was uh, a remarkable leader of the reparations effort in the latter part of the 19th century. Um, I think Queen Mother Audley Moore was actually concerned about post-slavery atrocities as well as slavery mm. itself. Oh. That's good to know. Uh, yeah. what's, 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 yes. what's significant about her connection to uh, to the emphasis on slavery is because her organization specifically was focused on reparations for Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States, right. despite the fact that she was one of the uh, central figures in the Pan-African movement. But her conception of who reparations should be for, reparations from the United States government, was specific to Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Uh, but that reparations was due not only for slavery itself, but all of the succeeding atrocities as mm, well. No, see, that's, that's, I, I appreciate that correction, my dear brother. Very much so. Very much. She's such a towering figure, though. She has so much style. She had a powerful intellect, full of spirit. She was a love warrior of the highest highest level and uh, um, uh, I, I wish she was more well known. I'm glad to hear about that Vanity Vanity Fair piece. I haven't seen that either by Sister Mullen. Right. Definitely. You know, you know, <clears throat> Dr. Dirty, I got a two part question to kind of open the door with you as well. Um, I know when we talk about you know, I don't want to be redundant, right? Because we've had these conversations before. This is like the fourth time I've had the privilege, the privilege of having you on the show, Dr. Darity. But, but just in case we got a couple people who are unfamiliar, could you explain the racial wealth gap, how the, the resolution, how we can solve the racial wealth gap, um, why reparations is what we see as, as you see as the remedy for that racial wealth gap and why it is so essential that we find a resolution for it? Well, the racial wealth gap is something that's been quite persistent. Uh, the ratio of black to white wealth in the United States has been completely out of whack in terms of the proportion of black people in the US population relative to the proportion of white people. So, you know, for instance, uh, Black Americans are somewhere in the vicinity of 13 to 14 percent of the U.S. population, but possess less than three percent of the nation's wealth. Uh, if you were to try to calculate what that meant on average per black and white household, uh, the most recent uh, data from the Survey of Consumer Finances for 2022 would indicate that the average black household has $1.15 million less in net worth than the average white household. Uh, and if you were to try to recalculate that on the basis of per person, given the size of black and white households, you come to a figure of about $400,000 per person. Uh, if, if you were to try to total that up across all black Americans 
whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. And that's somewhere in the vicinity of about 40 million people out of a total of maybe 47 million Black people in the United States. Uh, then you come up with a, a total gap uh, of $16 trillion between Black and white Americans in terms of the amount of wealth that Black people would have if they had wealth that was consistent with their proportion of the population. Um, and so, uh, so, so folks can then say, well, we have this big disparity, but it's, it's, it, it has, it has everything to do with bad behavior on the part of black Americans. Uh, but I think that the clips that you showed us from, um, from, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are clips that really tell us what the origins of this racial wealth gap uh, really, really amount to. Uh, and so I, I would start with uh, Dr. King's observation that at the end of the Civil War, Black Americans are promised 40-acre land grants as restitution for their years of bondage, and that promise is not kept. But at the same time, one and a half million white American families are given 160 acre land grants under the terms of the Homestead Act of 1862 in the Western territories. And this is the point where the United States is completing its colonial settler project. Uh, and those, those 1.5 million white families uh, actually constituted somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 12% of the white population at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so this is an, an extraordinary handout, if you will, that's given to white Americans and it creates the foundation for, uh, for economic, uh, economic prosperity across generations. And, and I will add, in the 20th century, the federal government moves away from asset building via land distribution to asset building by supporting home ownership. And it, it, in, and it does this in a highly discriminatory fashion. So we can, we can think about the phenomenon of redlining as a way in which Black Americans were excluded from the full benefits of home ownership. But we can also think about the GI Bill which was instrumental in building the white middle class in the United States. So returning veterans from World War II received significant subsidies and supports for purchasing homes, uh, but black returning veterans were denied access to the same set of opportunities. So in the extreme, you had a situation where in the state of Mississippi, out of approximately 3,700 returning veterans to that state, only two Black veterans received the benefits of the GI right. Bill for home ownership purposes. Right. And the North wasn't a heck of a lot better, because if you look at uh, Northern New Jersey and New York, uh, out, of, out of thousands of returning veterans, only about 100 Black veterans receive the home ownership benefits associated with the GI Bill. Mm. So American public policy has created this enormous gap in wealth. And so the uh, argument that Kirsten Mullen and I have been trying to take is, uh, is that we should be coming for the check that, that uh, Dr. King was talking about, that reparations for Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved here is the best mechanism for trying to eliminate the racial wealth gap in the United States. That's powerful, powerful. And I want the audience to uh, to know that what Brother Martin was talking about, what our dear Brother Sandy is talking about, they you turn to chapter three, who reaped the fruits of slavery? Scholarly argument laid out. There are just roads not taken in the early years of the Republic. Scholarly content with erudition. Alternatives to war and slavery, then the race and races within the Civil War. Then it goes all the way to until chapter 11 on Beyond Jim Crow. So that when we're talking about the text, it is very important to be intellectually equipped. See, we come out of the sixth chapter of Ephesians. We got to put on the whole armor, intellectual weaponry, moral weaponry, spiritual weaponry, organizational capacity, 
weaponry. That's what it is to be a love warrior and freedom fighter. And so when you have the scholarly weaponry and intellectual weaponry, as we do in the text, and then also connected with the deep love of the people, you know, just love the truth in the abstract. But you love the people who are suffering. Then you intervene, not a spectator. That's why we. Got, I'm, I'm having a dialogue tonight with my brothers and sisters in New York. They signed the bill. And I was just with Charles Barron, and actually the Operation Power was kind enough, first one to endorse me. I've known Charles and Inez Barron for 44 years, going back to House of Law, Pentecostal Church, and National Black United Front with Reverend Herbert Daltrey and so forth, also deeply tied to the reparations movement. But you get these bills where they get weakened and the government's going to point who's on the commission or they get some kind of, of a mixed arrangement. And we understand that. We, we, we support it. But we're about the truth all the way down. Justice all the way down. Justice denied is justice delayed. Justice delayed is justice denied. And the question becomes just pushing, pushing, pushing. And that's what I think is most, most important about what what Brother Sandy has stood for, really for all of these these years, 40 some, 40 some years, going back to the early work on, uh, on, on racial inequality and so on. You see that uh, 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 we, we need to be able to have a moral awakening and straighten our backs up so that in telling these truths, we become part of the process, the participants in the process. And so it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I know we've had relations with the autos, brother and sister, sister Yvette and brother Antonio and others in that regard. A lot of people been critical. Well, I don't agree with everything they talk about, but they talk about reparations. Oh, I want to be around folk talking about reparations. I want to be around folk who are mobilizing truths and insights as to how do you deal with the inequality. I would go as far as to say in some way, this is what I say in the barbershop. This is what I say on the show. When the first dignified African stepped off that barbaric slave ship with all of those bodies at the bottom of the ocean and went to that slave auction in the darkness of the American empire, the bowels of the American empire, we had two problems, too much poverty, not enough self-love. I'm an abolitionist. I want to abolish poverty across the board. So in a lot of ways you abolish poverty. Reparations is fundamental. Eliminating right to work states is another one. Supporting strong trade unions, supporting strong black businesses and so forth. I want to abolish poverty across the board. Redistribution of wealth. Then you got to have self-love. Got to have self-respect. You got to believe in yourself. You got to have confidence in yourself. The psychic and the spiritual go hand in hand with the economic and the political. You know, you know Dr. West, when we talk about reparations on the state level, we always, you know, we, we look at it and we say, you know, the state will never really be able to compensate, you know, its citizens for slavery and for Jim Crow and for discrimination, redlining, mass incarceration. Like a state is just not equipped to set up to, you know, to actually do that, you know, do that robustly in a way that would be actually acceptable based on the numbers. And that's why whenever I talk to Dr. Darity, he like centers me because, you know, I can go on a tangent like New York and what's going on in California, and there's a yeah. couple other states that are also considering, but it's like, there's a, a lot of folks who want to stay in the moral ground and say, well, I, I agree with it in spirit. But when Dr. Dirty starts laying those numbers out, it's like, no, we're talking about numbers. Like, we can quantify how much a body was worth and That's how right. much wealth was built on yeah. the backs of slaves, and the money is still in the system. It didn't go away. And the land, as you know, Absolutely. didn't go away. <laughs> so, Absolutely. You know, so, yeah. That's very, very, very real. Um, I mean, I'm looking at page 263. Uh, D, we view well, the look it up now. <laughs> as the most robust indicator of the cumulative economic effects of white supremacy in the United States. Mm -hmm. If the average black household consists of 3.31 one person, the mean shortfall in wealth for individual Black Americans would be approximately two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Am I am I reading right, my brother? Page two sixty three. 
That's it. Yes, but the book was published in 2020, so the number is higher now. That's true. That's a good point. But (laughs) yes, it's the same principle. (laughs) That's that's exactly right. We're in real time. We're in real time. Doctor Dirty, are you saying yesterday's price is not today's price? That's right. The longer they wait, the higher the bill gets. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? But you know, the, the golden rule is so subversive. I learned this at Vacation Bible School in Shiloh Baptist Church that if Black people had enslaved, Jim Crow, lynched, discriminated, de- degraded against white brothers and sisters, the reparation movement for white brothers and sisters would be a major movement. Major. All of a sudden, so many white brothers and sisters act as if we can't understand it, special special treatment, preferential treatment, affirmative action, running amok, and so forth. And we're talking about justice. But all you got to do is flip it over. And if we grew up in a Black supremacist empire, a Black supremacist society, with 244 years of white folk enslaved, and another 100 years of neo-slavery and lynching, and all the things we're talking about, it'd be a different conversation. So at the center of it is, a black life doesn't have the same value as a white life. So we got to try to somehow get a movement off the ground in the face of that kind of organized greed, institutionalized hatred, and routinized indifference to the plight of our vulnerable black brothers and sisters. So it's a moral and a spiritual issue, it's not just tribal. We're talking about morality here. The um, the novelist Stephen Barnes had a, 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 a series of books in which he imagined a world in which uh, Black people had colonized uh, the eastern part of the United States and Northern Europeans were their enslaved folk. And my reaction in reading that book was, exactly what you just said wow wouldn't there have been a mammoth movement for reparations on behalf of these northern europeans who had been enslaved uh, had the history been reversed in that manner Um, uh, and i'm wondering you know if people would have a stronger sense of empathy if they read those novels and thought about a situation in which the tables were completely turned. Um, but also, you know, I was thinking that uh, it's it's really important, and, and here's where I may disagree with you a bit. It's really important to not think about reparations as an anti-poverty measure. Mm. Reparations, from my perspective, is a, a, a an unpaid debt. Yes, yes, and, yes. And unpaid debt is not really connected to whether an individual is living in poverty today. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's it's something that is owed collectively to Black Americans, and it's something that Black Americans merit as a consequence right. of this nation's history. So I would right. want I like- to I would want to locate yes. anti-poverty programs of the other types that you've described in a different in a different domain from uh from from oh, reparations. No, I, yeah, I'm sorry. And I, and I I, I I personally I'm an advocate of I, an array oh, of anti-poverty programs, oh. but I see those as being designed to be universal for all Americans to try to improve the lives of all Americans as opposed to reparations which is supposed to address a very specific set of harms and damages that have been inflicted on a particular segment of the U.S. population, Black yeah. Americans whose whose ancestors were enslaved. Oh, and I see that that's so important, though. And I, I, I again, I stand corrected, my brother, because for me, there's two rails. There's a rail of citizens, and those citizens, by being citizens, have a right to health care, have a right to quality education, have a right to job with a living wage and so forth. And an anti-poverty program speaks to them as citizens. And that includes black folk, but includes everybody else in the US society. Mm -hmm. Then you got the other rail, which is those who were sub-citizens, anti-citizens, non-citizens, subjects, enslaved, Jim Crow, Jane Crow. That's a second rail. And that's where reparations speaks 
to that particular slice of the citizenry who are descendants of uh, 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 um, in, in Africans enslaved, Africans Jim Crow, and so forth. And that's a very important distinction. So I, I, I do agree with you, my brother. I do very mm -hmm. much agree with you. But I want to add this, though, Brother Tim. I'm sorry to go on. Mm -hmm. That I want, I want your, your audience to know that Brother Sandy is one of the very, very, very few social scientists and economists who actually teach Afro-American literature as a source of social theory, as a source of insights about the political and economic condition of Black folk. Most economists are very specialized, and they're not reading Barnes or Toni Morrison or Ralph Ellison, Gene Toomer. But we're looking at a brother who is just so transdisciplinary that he's able to have a conversation with the literary people, with the social theorists from sociology, with the economists. And he trained at MIT. You know, MIT is the bastion of mainstream economics. This is what Larry Summers, we can go on and on. Even Brother Glenn Lowry studying with Robert Solo. This is, this is MIT. You know what I mean? Hey, Jesus Christ. And where does he go? Right to truth and justice for the least of these. Beginning on the chocolate side, but he's concerned about all of them. He's, he's old school in that sense. He like me. You see, he, he starts with the chocolate and it gets to vanilla and brown and other people here and around the world. That's the morality of it. But this is something that's worth noting. And that's and it's something that I just wanted to highlight, really, not just for us, but for the others who are listening in terms of who we really have on, on the show here. Well, Brother Cornell, you're very generous, but uh, I think I'm just mostly an idiosyncratic economist. <laughs> 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 well, <clears throat> everyone here agrees reparations is old, essential, and old. Uh, I hesitate to use any other word than is then then it's old, and that's crazy because I I mean I have that in bold capital letters here. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been through the Dr. Sandy Dirty School of Reparations, folks. <laughs> so so my question is, how can we move forward to making reparations happen, given the structures that are in place? What steps can we take to make reparations for Black Americans a reality? Let's talk about HA4, HR 40. Um, it's in place. Some feel that HR 40 is counterproductive to the goal of actually getting us reparations and the Reparations Act, because we know it's just a study to look at what if we did this. Um, and we encourage all our viewers to go read it. It's very short. I reread it at the request of Dr. Darity. Um, we need to study, determine how blacks are impacted by slavery, Jim Crow, mass incarceration. My thing is, it was written in 1989. Things have changed since 1989. We got well, all types been, of stuff. It's been rewritten. It's, it's been, been rewritten been, since, yeah. Been updated, updated since then. Well, not necessarily for the better, but it's been rewritten. <laughs> but my thing is, don't we have enough studies by Brookings Institution from... All, that, all these institutions that have studied we, the we impact have, of slavery. We have many studies, and, you know, um, egotistically, I would say that our book, From Here to Equality, is an attempt at a study for uh, making the case for reparations. Uh, the, uh, the first half of the uh, California Reparations Task Force report, their mammoth report, the first half is a document about the entire history of atrocities against Black Americans in the United States, not just in California, but nationwide. Uh, it's a superb portion of their report. It's To me, it's a, at least as strong a document as the Kerner Report of 1968. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, we have a host of studies. However, it is quite normal for Congress to establish a commission to provide it with its own report prior to initiating a project on this scale and of this magnitude. And so, you know, before Japanese Americans received reparations, uh, there was a commission that was established uh, that was uh, uh, on, on, um, 
the incarceration of uh, of Japanese Americans during the course of World War II, which generated the report that was the foundation for congressional action. So I, I don't necessarily object to the idea of a commission that is supposed to provide Congress with a plan of action. But I do object to the specifics of H.R. 40, which I think potentially will produce a commission that will not give Congress the type of report that would give us true reparations. Dr. West, mm -hmm. as, as someone running for president, how do you feel about H.R. 40? And, and do you have uh, ideas about how we could uh, make it more robust or make it speak more clearly to the, the actual situation Black folks find themselves in? You know, the older I get and the closer I get to death, I have less patience with these commissions and investigations and so forth. So often they become modes of evasion. That We've got to have folks who are raising their voices and bringing power and pressure to bear. You see, with Brother Martin and Fannie Lou Hamer and Stokely Carmichael and Diane Nash in the 1960s, they didn't need no three, four, six, eight year investigation of how black people been catching hell. When they hit the ground, lo and behold, we got a civil rights bill. Lo and behold, we got a voting rights bill. Now that the backlash was ugly, no doubt about that. Four sisters in 16th Street, Birmingham, that's where we're going to be for Martin Luther King Day and so on. But as much as I'm, uh, the, the, there's a role for commissions and investigations, but you see the status quo has a way of wanting to kind of bring in uh, uh, folk that think that somehow that bringing power and pressure to bear, but they're diffusing and neutralizing it and sanitizing it and sterilizing and deodorizing it. And you say, wait a minute, we catching hell. We own, you know, we in the stove. That's emergency, that's catastrophe. And this is one of the ways in which even scholarship has done this. You see, if you reduce race to a problem, there's never been a race problem in America. There's been catastrophes visited upon black people. If you reduce it just to a little problem, people say, well, American democracy's got a race deficit or democracy deficit. We deal with this little problem in a managerial way by means of all of these compromises, then black folk ought to be happy. You saw that with the politicians, put black faces in high places, lo and behold, it's over. We can solve the problem. No, the, the catastrophe is still there. Right. Look in the hood, look in mass incarceration, look at the low quality of school, look at the deficit, the, 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 the low quality housing and so forth and so on. So we have to be blues like, blues by catastrophe. You ain't never heard no blues man or blues woman sing about no problem. At all. Good morning, heartache ain't no problem. That's a catastrophe. Strange fruit ain't no problem. That's a catastrophe. Nobody loves me but my mommy. She might be, she might be driving. I'm too. driving too. <laughs> yeah, that ain't no problem. Baby <laughs> ain't got no problem. That Negro's wrestling with catastrophe. So it is with all of us. We've been terrorized, traumatized, hated. That ain't no problem. If you reduce it to a problem, then you got a nice little rational discourse. Everybody come in feeling that they, they objective and so forth. It's not, I don't have objectivity about somebody messing with my grandmama. That's a catastrophe. I got to do something about it. Urgency. In some way. Right. And that's, a, that, 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 that's the story of Brother Sandy. That's the story of Williams Dargity mm. Sr. Because you're looking at a JR right now. Mm. That's Evangeline. Come we, they, they, they they knew they were dealing with catastrophe. How could they equip themselves, pass on the rich tradition to the younger generation? And then now Brother Sandy here, passing it on to younger generation like yourself and some of the others building on his magnificent and erudite scholarly works and political works and spiritual and literary work. That's, I think, the, the framework that we have to keep in mind when we think about HR 40, HR X, HR Y. Uh, yes, yes, but that's just one small slice. We need folk out here fighting. Social movements, organizations, more unity, not unanimity, unity coming together. You know, <clears throat> Joe Biden could put together a commission tomorrow if he wanted to. That's simple. He could do an executive order for a commission 
to do the study. He doesn't need to wait for Congress to get that done. And since we, we you know, we tend to vote Democrat so so often, you would think that would be something that our Congressional Black Caucus and many others will be pushing for. But I don't hear that push. <laughs> I don't hear people talking about it. Dr. Darity, what do you think? Well, um, I, I I would think it would be great if uh, President Biden appointed a presidential commission to provide Congress with uh, guidelines for uh, for for uh, for a reparations plan. But I would hope that it would not be a commission that would mimic the type of commission mm -hmm. that would yeah, be produced yeah. by HR forty. Uh, and in addition, I think, and and this is crucial, any commission that's appointed, uh, its its findings and results will be contingent upon who is appointed to the commission. Absolutely. And this is a this is a subject that is too sensitive and significant to rely upon the whims of individuals who are appointed to a commission to decide without any kind of direction for what the content of their report should say. And so since I feel very strongly that, that any reparations plan for black American descendants of US slavery must center on four pillars. First, that the eligible community must be those black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. Second, that the amount of the reparations plan must be sufficient to eliminate the racial wealth gap in the United States. I view that as a minimum. That mm -hmm. has to be the baseline. Third, it's the federal government that will take responsibility for making payments. And fourth, and finally, the payments will be distributed to eligible recipients for them to use at their discretion. Uh, and so those four features are central and they have to be built into the charge that's given to any commission that is going to generate a report for Congress. And so if the president were to appoint such a, con such a commission, I would want the president to include those four pillars as instructions to the commission about the shape and form that their report must ultimately take. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're whistling in the wind. Absolutely. And I can tell you this, you see, under a West administration, what you just heard, this brother would be the leader, this would be the foundation of the commission. The commission wouldn't have to do too much work. All they have to do is just update from 2020 to 2025. <laughs> That's all you have to do. Just a little appendix at, in, in and, the back. And, and correct our typos. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. But it's in the name of truth and justice. That's the crucial thing. I, I want to keep coming back to that, you see. And unfortunately, you know, with the fascism of Trump that's escalating and the military adventurism of Biden that's escalating and the choice now between somebody who's pushing us to Civil War II and on the other hand, World War III. Well, what kind of choice is that? I'd like Frederick Douglass in the 1840s. You got two slaveholders running for president. What you gonna do, brother Fred? <laughs> what you gonna do, man? First thing, I'm gonna say a prayer and have a drink and try to crack a smile so I can keep staying my right mind, right? I mean, that's one of the first things you got to do. So you get fortified enough to keep fighting. So people don't cave in and sell out because they, 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 they're they overwhelmed. Goliath looked like it's capital G. Oh, you're over, no, David got something. David got something in that slingshot. We got something in our slingshot. We got our tradition. We got our ancestors. We got those who loved us and poured into us unbelievable courage and compassion and empathy. We got something for the world and each other. We just had to hold on to that. And so in that regard, it seems to me that this becomes a, a, an issue that we can highlight. And this is in some ways, I think it's, uh, I would like to see this issue talked about in the same way the Palestinian issues talked about. 
See, right now, globally, that becomes a litmus test to see what kind of integrity and honesty and courage you got. Are you for genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid-like conditions or not? That's all we want to know. We don't need no investigations. We don't need no commissions and so forth. Take a stand. Well, same is true with truth and justice as it relates to Black people. We want to know where you stand. Now, if you're scared, go on and say that. Well, I, I, I agree with Professor Dougherty. We know he's been putting in all of this labor with Sister Mullins, but I, I, I can't say that because my money and donors and benefactors won't allow me to say that. Then go on and be honest about it. You're scared. People get scared. Everybody's been scared in life. Go on and tell the truth. You're scared. You don't want to tell the truth. That's what Kat said, right? 2020, folks, the year of truth. Now, I don't believe any of us have a monopoly of truth. See, I'm a Christian, so... I know we crack vessels. I'm just trying to love my crooked neighbor with my crooked heart. I know I, I, I'm still a Christian in that sense. I don't have a monopoly on it. I'm not self-righteous about it, but I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. I'm not intimidated. That's what we need. And once you have that, then when you look in the eyes of Brother Martin when he was speaking, did you see Harriet Tubman? Did you see Frederick Douglass? Did you see Marcus Garvey? Did you see Sarah Vaughn, Mahalia Jackson? It's all up in his eyes. It's in his heart. He ain't scared. And he's willing to fight and tell the truth. Hey. That's it. What we talk about. You say the, <laughs> truth. the truth doesn't oh. need motivation. So, oh, you got but to have courage you know, you to tell the kind of truth. There's something really, really uh, vital that you mentioned, though, about Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. about the point at which there are two slaveholders running for president and and Frederick Douglass does not quit the fight. That's exactly right. And and, you know, I, if if we went if we went back to, say, 1951 in South Africa, people might think that apartheid would never come to an end but there were folks who had the courage to fight and similarly when people say that we'll never get reparations That's right. it's important that we try to have the courage to fight for it because there are many things that people said would never happen that actually have taken place Absolutely. Uh, but i would also add that we do have some grounds for for optimism. Uh, in in uh, the year 2000, a survey was taken of American attitudes towards reparations. And at that point, only 4% of white Americans endorsed monetary payments for black Americans as re reparations. Uh, this was a study that was done by Michael Dawson and Ravana Popoff, two faculty members at the University of Chicago. The most recent study I've seen is a survey that was conducted by a team at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst that was uh, reported in January 2023, a year ago. And that study found that closer to 30% of white Americans now endorse reparations for Black Americans. I think that this is the basis for uh, building an effective movement that could produce a Congress that might actually enact the type of reparations plan we have in mind. But it re it will require a struggle. It, it's it's yes. yeah. Uh, yes. uh, at least we may have the 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 tools to to make that struggle happen in the present moment, given the current attitudes. And and I think it's because of that change in white attitudes that we have had the reaction that we have observed in states like Florida to so-called critical race theory, which is really an assault on teaching the truth. That's you right. use the term truth and justice. It's an assault on teaching the truth about American history. That's exactly right. And I want to remind the readers that the first epigraphs in this book, Introduction, Standing at the Crossroads, Ella Baker. In order to see where we're going, we not only must see where we have been, but we must also understand where we have been. And then Frederick Douglass, celebrating the past, anticipating the future, 1875. I won't read all of it but it reads almost word for word what Martin said. 
the four million who were released, emancipated, and then just thrown into the whirlwind, thrown into the hurricane, thrown into new forms of white supremacy with no help. And then you wonder why somehow they're not competitive. So it's that connection of the best of the past, the courage in the present, and then like Duke Ellington say, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And what he was talking about is don't accept the notion that there's no alternative. Play the flat note, stay in the minor key, go under the note, go on top of the note. You are gonna find a way out of no way. That's the history of black people at our best. We've crossed the Jordan and see Pharaoh on both sides. What we gonna do? We gonna keep fighting anyway. We're going to keep laughing. We're going to keep loving. We're going to keep swinging. We're going to keep organizing anyway. Why? Because what is impossible when it's achieved, people say it's inevitable. No, no. It was those who understood what you said was impossible it became something to fight for anyway. And you end up creating some beautiful, beautiful things like Sun Rock. Black people tried everything possible. Let's try the impossible. Come with me on the mothership. Listen to my orchestra. This is before George Clinton. This is before Funkadelic. Come with me on the mothership. I'm going to take you to Pluto tonight. Okay, Clarence. That's his real name from Alabama. Okay, Sun Ra. Okay, go on and take us to Mars tonight. And by the third, second hour, you say, this brother telling the truth. I feel like I'm levitating. What is going on? He didn't confront it what looks like is impossible, and he didn't help change my life. You see, that's a beautiful thing. Some of us found it in the church with Jesus, but you're looking for breakthroughs. Somehow you get a breakthrough because everything seems impossible. That's what we're talking about. From here to equality. How you going to do it? Just read the history of these great people at our best. I ain't talking about the cowards and the, and the thugs and the gangsters. I'm talking about the best of Black folk. That's what we're talking about. And that's very much you know, what our discussion, both in the campaign and the movement's all about. Can white America <clears throat> handle black America having autonomy in this country? This is, a, this is not a new phenomenon. Well, it is a new phenomenon that black folks um, are able to have uh, control over their own bodies. Can they grapple with black people as a whole demanding anything of this sort? So I, I guess what I'm trying to get at there is, as we try to, get white folks to join us in this movement, are we at risk of diluting uh, our, our, our demands? Are we making demands or are we making asks? Are we making pretty please because y'all consider maybe treating us like human beings and giving us what you would want if it was you? Or, uh, you know, are we at a risk of doing that? Or how do we proceed to, to gain, you know, allyship? I, I believe we need allies. But at what cost are we, are we trying to attract those allies? I, I think in principle, I would not want to attract allies at the cost of dilution of what is the type of program of change we need in the United States. So I think that the critical thing is that some way, somehow, we have to persuade the vast majority of Americans to make a true commitment to justice. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on how you do that, but, but that's the task. Dr. West, you, you're the that's, one who's that's uh, where the issue in the is. arena. You're, the, you're in the arena, sir. How, how do you do it, Dr. West? How do you, how do you make that beckoning on to justice? Uh, the more implications, but still staying firm in the, in the actual reality of what black people are up against and maintain that balance. Well, one is that uh, I mean, Coltrane and Aretha are gonna sing the same songs in the Apollo that they sing in Carnegie Hall, you see. It's gonna be on their terms. If you wanna come here, Coltrane to Carnegie Hall, he gonna play my favorite things. He gonna play Giant Step, Love Supreme, the same way he played it in Small's Paradise in Harlem. Why? Because he's got integrity. He can be improvisational, but that's not opportunism. He's got integrity. <laughs> when Professor Darity goes to the American Economic Association or a member of some of the most erudite societies of scholars, 
he got the same argument, the same rigorous treatment of the data, and the same vision as rooted in the hearts and souls of Black folk. That's integrity. But if you're going to get folk who are posing and posturing and saying one thing in Harlem and saying something else at Carnegie Hall or saying one thing on 125th Street and something else on Wall Street, then that's called lack of integrity. You just call it for what it is. It's a cat way of moment. It's just lack of integrity. And we have to just call it out. We call it out. Now, improvisation is different. Everybody's going to do it in a different way. He says, so everybody doesn't have to have one way. I don't believe there's one way kind of stuff. Everybody does it in a different way. People know when people are lying or integrity or scared of putting out half truth, but you do it in different ways. Martin King got a different way of doing it. Then pray for your win. Then Gardner Taylor. Then Manuel Scott. Then Adam Clayton Powell. All these are different kind of black folks, different kind of Negroes in those days. That's who we are. There's no, there's no, there's no problem with that. You know what I mean? But they have to have integrity. If it looks like they're selling out, you got to say it. Hmm. If they caving in, say it. You're diluting, say it. You getting scared? Acknowledge it. We praying for you. We holding up. We holding you, holding you back up. You know, everybody gets scared. You need to be pushed or get out of the way and let somebody else do it who's got the backbone. That to me is the crucial thing. Reparations is a political function. It's a it's not a private remedy or repair. So it's That's a right. government repair. So That's we got to work with the government. Like one of my things, Dr. West, Dr. Dirty, is that there are people that I'm not sure if they really want reparations because they're not interested in politics. I don't like politics either. There's just things that my community needs that we can't do on our own. Like government... But has to do the water. But staying please. out of what we call the political process is a political act also. Oh, exactly. There's nothing that isn't politics ultimately. Okay. So we have to make a choice to be engaged and we have to make a choice to fight for what is right. That's exactly right. I took the words out of my mouth right there. Ditto, ditto, ditto. It's if you don't gotta like it, folks. I understand it's um, it's um, you know, um, it's a, it's difficult. People people have turned off. They have a they have an affront to politics for a reason because they don't trust politicians for the most part, um, and and they, they understand the system's corrupt. That's what it is. Even right. great people going into a corrupt system. You, you know, Doctor West talked about putting on the armor. You know, you got to put on a strong armor. You're tough. gonna need your grandmama's prayers. You're gonna need Uncle Nick's prayers and Aunt Payne's prayers. <laughs> and you're gonna need to listen to a lot of James Brown and Phyllis Hyman. I mean, you're gonna need some wind at your back. That's all I'm saying. And I do believe that because we all have faults and, and foibles, though, that we need each other. You see, you can't do it by yourself. You just can't do it by yourself. Definitely, you okay. got that a community. And when I say community, I don't mean just community of the quick. You need a community of the dead too. Wow. You know what I mean? I know this, this, this time when Brother Sandy's sitting there writing and it's almost as if Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass is speaking to him in his ear. You see, that's, that's part of his community. Mm -hmm. The community of those who's gone before who leave these rich legacies. They're clouds of witnesses that Keep us on the straight and narrow. Martin was the same. There were days Martin couldn't get out of bed. What would he do? Get a call from Mahalia Jackson. She'd sing that song with Thomas Dorsey. He wrote that song when his mom, when his wife and his baby died the same day. Precious Lord, take my hand. Sing it for me, Mahalia. I can't get out of bed. I can't deal with what's going on with the FBI and so forth and so on. Sing it for me. And she sang that song and that brother walk out there, a soldier, capital S. Yes, he needed others. He needed Stokely. He needed Coretta. He needed others. We're the same way. Let's talk money. I think we already did, but um, it's difficult for anyone who's not a straight-up racist to deny slavery was a horrible institution. Jim Crow was sanctioned by state governments and the federal government directly stifled Black American pursuit of happiness as outlined in the Constitution or even for citizenship. So... Uh, they always fall back on the money part. Always the money. What are we going to do? How are we going to get the money? Dr. West, 
Can you speak to how America can pay for reparations to black Americans, descendants of slavery, freedmen, B1, and uh, foundation of black Americans? I don't want to leave anybody out. No, I think I follow what Brother Sandy said, what Professor Darity said, that we got these two rails. I'm concerned about human beings and citizens, no matter what colors, gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. I want them to tr be treated fairly. I want them to live in a just society. But justice for me requires something beyond just what citizens have access to. We're talking about those who have been treated as subsets, and that's where reparations is. And that's the good news. I mean, you go from 4% to 30%. Wow. That's put a smile on Queen Mother Moore's play, her face. And she was a strong black nationalist and pan African. I can tell you that. I remember her speeches. Not very strong. How and do we so, pay for uh, it, Dr. West? What, what do you say when they say, how do we pay for it? Oh, shoot, we could easily pay for it. Man, we got trillions and trillions of money that invested in wars. We got 62 cents for every $1 going to the military industrial complex. We got 800 military units around the world and special operations in over 100 countries. That's war priority. We got so much money that is transferred to military that if we had a disinvestment of a significant sort and a reinvestment in everyday people, all colors, but we're talking about reparations right now on the chocolate side of town, on especially the black American side, those tied to US slavery. Oh, we have the money. Oh my God, Jess, we have the money, definitely. You know, but I, 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 I'm supposed to be in, in, in a Zoom though, y'all, gotcha, about gotcha. 15, but it, 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 are we doing all right? We, do, we, we can wrap it up, uh, Dr. Dr. Dirty, yeah, we did go over time, Dr. Dirty. Oh, oh no, you can bring us back, though, because I, I come anytime, Brother Sandy, yep. yeah, I'm showing up. <laughs> you that right now, but All I'm right. <laughs> Man, I, I appreciate you very much. And, and Dr. Dirty, if I could, I'd like to give you the last word. This is perfect, Absolutely. Dr. Dirty. Well, how can we close it out, sir? Yeah. Uh, I I just think that, um, you know, I think that it's it's important that people recognize that that uh, Brother Cornell is an advocate of reparations, unequivocally, and uh, that I think our points of view are largely simpatico. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if 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 people want to hear more about the content or specifics of what a true reparations program should look like, you know, I'll be glad to communicate with them at any point. And uh, Brother Cornell, if you would like uh, any kind of engagement for me in in your project and in, in your campaign with respect to the full design of a reparations program, you know, I'd be glad to, no, to, to, to provide whatever I can on that score. Oh, that's, that's because that's chapter 13 in this text. This is what I tell folk on the road and speeches. And just read chapter 13 to get a sense of what the framework is, what the content is, and so forth. So we'll be in much closer contact as things as things proceed in this regard. But I thank you, Brother Tim, for all of your uh, magnificent uh, support and love. And uh, and love is always, it's, it's, it's critical. You help all of us to think critically and Socratically with serious uh, courage and then still come down on the side of the least of these. This is the key. And Thank that's you, one of the keys that's always unlocked the door to the black freedom struggle. That's what makes us in part such a world historical people. It's hard to be hated for this long and still dish out all the love that we do. We never lose that great tradition. It's getting weak, but we're not going to lose it. No, not at all. But I know we got to run. Okay. That's it. Go all see right. Dr. Thank Cornell you. West. Thank you. CornellWest24.com. Dr. Dirty from Here to Equality. Pick up the book on Amazon. I love y'all. Thank you for tuning Tell in. Me. Thank you for facilitating this conversation. Absolutely. Much brother. appreciated. Absolutely, indeed. Brother Sandy, God bless you and your family. God Take bless care, you man. All. Happy New Year. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thank you, Brother Tim. You got it. Thank you, Dr. West and Dr. Dirty, for this special reparations conversation inspired by the great legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. To support the work coverage and production of the Tim Black Show, become a member today at jointimblack.com. You can contact us directly at clientcare at timblacktv.com. Happy 
Martin Luther King Jr. Day.